Welcome to Growing Concern. We're going to talk about the Trans-Pacific uh, situation they were just talking about there, the, the partnership uh, with Elizabeth Swagger. She said she'd be here around 7, going to be running a little late, a lot of traffic out there. And we've got some clips like the one we just got off of YouTube there that will be playing. And she's running a little late. It's just a few minutes after 7. But she's got a lot of good information. There's a rally coming up the July 2nd. We're going to talk about that. A uh, lot of information, and, you know, there's two things I think that affect us a lot, and that is the food bill, which they're discussing right now, and I think under the food bill, they're, they're trying to cut uh, welfare, or at least food stamps, enormously, they meaning the right wing, and, also, and then also what we're, gonna, we're talking about here is free trade agreements. Free trade agreements affect us enormously. You know, ask anybody that's lost a job to NAFTA or, or uh, the, some, of, some of the similar uh, consequences of, of what has been going on because of these NAFTA-like agreements. And the Trans-Pacific Partnership is NAFTA on steroids. It's taking the whole Pacific Rim and uh, making, a, uh, making it real tough for everyday people, although some, some folks are going to get really wealthy out of it. And uh, folks that already have a lot of wealth, probably Mitt Romney, who knows. But we'll pull the tape we had to play next, and we'll pull a tape on with a fellow talking, um, Ted Glickman, talking about uh, some of the situations we're talking about at an earlier Trans-Pacific uh, Forum. And then when, uh, when uh, Elizabeth shows up, we'll uh, just kind of fade out on that, bring her in, mic her up, and we'll continue with the program. So if he's got that ready yet, stretch it out. So we're not ready yet. I curse the traffic sometimes. <laughs> Makes it real tough. But uh, it was tough for me to get here as well. So uh, Elizabeth is, is the assistant director of the, of the Oregon Fair Trade campaign. Oh, we got Ted Glickman right here. So we'll bring Ted on until Elizabeth shows up. Um, and then two quick final points. First, we all know that imports without top quality labor and environmental standards are a scam and a sham. Second, we all know that exports are not automatically good, not necessarily an economic plus, especially as we become more and more a resource colony for Asia. One example, industrial timber companies have gutted Oregon's lumberjack, sawmill, lumber, and paper production jobs by clear-cutting and exporting raw logs. And Greg gave us a lot more salient and and substantive detail about exactly how brutal and how greedy that's been. Third, we all know that the WTO is an imposition on human rights, a conspiracy by the 1%. It's causing the destruction of basic sovereignty, and it needs to be stopped. Now, that's a topic for another day, but it's important because it's a key piece of the long-term solution. For simplicity, I'm calling these three issues the trade rapes, because there's a new one on the way. Now, here are the two key things we need to know. First, climate disruption is real. It's already happening big time. It's being caused primarily by industrial society based on fossil fuels, and it's probably going to get much worse, much more quickly than we expect. Second, we can solve the jobs crisis with clean, green, good jobs, union jobs, and adapt to climate disruption at the same time, with a full court press on renewable energy, building reconstruction, infrastructure reconstruction and development, and agriculture and forest rehabilitation and development. All of these technologies and concepts are ready for prime time. These are not pie in the sky. These are available. This leads us to two conclusions on Pacific trade. First, we're facing a major push to export fossil fuels from the Pacific Northwest. And this will make everything worse on all of these problems. The use of American coal and natural gas for manufacturing in Asia 
will just give them cheap energy to continue to undercut jobs here, in no small part because their environmental standards are so much lower. While the emissions from this manufacturing based on these exported cheap fossil fuels will speed up the climate disruption throughout the globe. Exporting fossil fuels is the fourth trade rape. Second, the huge fights just beginning over those export plans offer labor a whole new set of allies on the trade rapes. Two in particular stand out to me. Urban suburban white collar employees and college students. There are millions of people working in non-union jobs who are becoming increasingly concerned about climate disruption and they are overwhelmingly positive toward renewables and sustainable solutions. And college students are reading the facts, not watching Fox News. They understand the science and they are deeply worried. We can build alliances across normal boundaries if we take advantage of these changes in the demographics and the economy that we're facing. Finally, there are a couple things that I hope can help us. A Saudi oil minister said many years ago, the Stone Age did not end because we ran out of stone. We came up with something better. We started to tap into uh, ancient sunlight, ancient energy stores, fossil fuels, and it provided us with the beauties and the strengths and the pleasures of industrial society. We all use fossil fuels every day. But we have reached a point now, we have moved into a series of tipping points, many of which may be irrevocable, where fossil fuels have flipped from a plus to a minus. And there's nothing written in stone that says that we have to burn every last drop of hydrocarbon on the planet now that we have better clean green technologies that can provide us with clean green good jobs. The fossil fuel industry will tell us just the opposite. Let's stick with what we know. But the best way to understand what's currently going on is to look at extreme weather and to look at the ice. Think about Joplin, Missouri. Uh, I was on the East Coast right after and during the, after, the long, long aftermath of Hurricane Irene. Think about the drought in Texas and Oklahoma and northern Mexico where there are now two million people, two million people in northern Mexico without water as we sit here tonight, as I sip, as I speak. Assembling out of the hills at, at points a, a, across the region where the government is trucking in water. So if they come north looking for survival, should we send water trucks or should we beef up the border? What kind of choice do you think the politicians who are passing these trade agreements will make? Our current experiences with extreme weather are just the tip of the iceberg, another bad pun. And the ice itself is beginning to tell the tale. Sea level has risen by eight inches since 1950, since we started having really good information uh, to track it. And that rate of increase has doubled in the last 12 to 15 years. And that rate of increase uh, is accelerating as we speak. There's a group in Colorado called Extreme Ice Survey, uh, University of Colorado, and they do wonderful photography of the uh, kinds of things that are actually happening. Ice is not a computer model. Ice is not a group of climatologists trying to figure out one of the most complicated uh, sets of systems that people have ever examined. Ice can be measured directly and it can be looked at. Um, I'm going to pass this around, but there are two pictures that I think you can sort of see uh, from a distance here. Um, 
We've all seen pictures of glaciers vanishing, uh, starting to uh, expose ground that has not been exposed for millennia. Uh, you may be familiar with uh, Otzi, as he was named the uh, uh, 14,000-year-old uh, murder victim who was found in the Italian Alps as one of the glaciers re retreated there. Uh, was killed by an, an arrow to the back, uh, as it turns out. But glaciers don't just retreat, they also thin out. I think you can see the uh, uh, Empire State Building uh, showing how this particular glacier uh, has dropped down, not just pulled back, but also dropped down in terms of size. So if you happen to have a place on the coast you should be aware that there are um, two institutions that are at the cutting edge of uh, the of of the analysis of climate disruption and climate change. One is the insurance industry, and the other is the military-industrial complex, the CIA and the Pentagon. Uh, they're deep into how to cope. And uh, I, we'll be seeing, over the next few years, we'll be seeing increasing insurance rates. It's already happened in Florida. The Republican legislature in Florida, uh, because of, of the hurricanes uh, and uh, the, the beginnings, the impending beginnings of uh, sea, uh, coastal erosion from sea level increase, uh, has really been, uh, Insurance has been abandoned in Florida, and the Republican legislature has created a state-owned insurance company as the insurer of last resort uh, with Floridians' tax dollars uh, because they had no option. People couldn't sell houses because they couldn't get homeowners insurance. Uh, but one Katrina-type hurricane will completely wipe out that entire new state corporation which is the same size as the entire state budget. So, so this stuff is brutal, and it's going to get worse. I was telling Kim that I typically introduce myself to people now by saying, um, yeah. I'm obviously a member of the generation destroying the earth for your generation. Sorry about that. Hope you do better. Some of us still want to make a difference. That conversation usually then finishes up with, um, and could I please have the house coffee with extra room? because that's the jobs that are available for your generation. So we have a lot of work to do, and we've been led well so far by the people who are inspiring us to do it. Thank you. All right, I think he's got it together in there finally. And welcome back to the program. We have Elizabeth Swagger here from the Oregon Fair Trade Campaign. Welcome to the program. Thank you so much, All Jim. All right, I appreciate you taking the time from your busy life to show up and talk about these issues. Well, I'm happy to be here. All right. Um, the, uh, your assistant director of the Oregon Fair Trade Campaign, and uh, Arthur Stamolos is the, is the director. Now, he's the national director now, too, as well. He is. Of the Fair Trade Campaign. Citizen Trade Campaign, that's right. Citizens Trade, and it's Oregon Fair Trade Campaign here, right. So we have graphic for the for the Oregon, but people will be able to find the other one as well. So uh, I know you had a list of things that you wanted to cover, and we're, we've lost, what, 15 minutes of, bro of the program so far, but you, you kind of wanted to give a little bit of a, of a primer of uh, trade trade agreements 101. So this, you know, we could probably just start off there. Okay, great. Well, first, let me give just a little bit more background on Oregon Fair Trade Campaign. Sure. Um, we're a statewide coalition. Um, we're 30 organizations, uh, labor, environmental, and human rights groups. And we predominantly work on um, uh, fighting um, corporate globalization through free trade agreements. Um, like NAFTA, for example. And, and Korean Free Trade Agreement. And the Korean right. Free Trade Agreement is a great example. Um, what we do try and do at the same time is push for a positive vision of international trade. So that's trade that um, is negotiated with the public interests in mind. So that it's uh, 
uh, policies that include environmental protections and that um, protect workers. So I think that's really important to mention as well. Um, to get back to Trade 101, I think it's important to start off mm -hmm. with NAFTA, which is the North American Free Trade Agreement. Um, that's what put it on the map with people. That's exactly it. And it really set the stage for all other trade agreements that followed. It was passed in 94. Um, under Democrat. Under Democrats, yeah. that's right. And um, you know, it, it's, uh, it was a trade deal that had devastating impacts um, for workers uh, here in the U.S. and, um, and abroad. So for, uh, for workers in the U.S., um, 2.5 million jobs have been certified by the U.S. Um, by the U.S. Um, uh, Trade Bureau, and they have uh, they've shown that um, you know this trade deal uh, has resulted in uh, corporations being able to seek out the cheapest uh, labor, um, and not only that, uh, it's also increased the deficit for Oregon um, for and not just Oregon, but throughout the, the country. Um, before NAFTA passed, we had, uh, we had a, a pretty decent um, trade uh, surplus with Mexico. After it passed, uh, we had a massive deficit. On top of that, um, since uh, China's joined the WTO, we have a gargantuan trade deficit with them as well. Um, deficit meaning that uh they buy more of our products than we buy from them, or vice versa? We buy more of their products than, than they buy of ours. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as a country, if you're uh, year after year uh, buying more than you're selling, obviously that's going to have an impact. Um, it's not something that we would do in our own homes. And so as a country, um, doing that with our finances is not responsible mm -hmm. as well. So you... Uh, you NAFTA was with uh, United States, Canada, and Mexico, and you do hear a lot about the problems we've had in Mexico, but did it affect Canada at all? Yeah, it, it did as well. Um, I think a lot of Canadians uh, saw their jobs lost, and you know, it, 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 Mexico, it was the same situation. For Mexico, um, what they saw is uh, huge waves of U.S. subsidized agriculture, uh, corn and other grains, dumped on their market and it forced a lot of uh, Mexican farmers off of their land and essentially um, a lot of farmers were forced to migrate in search of work um, which is you know something that is often mm -hmm. not understood mm -hmm. yeah but which, which has a lot to do with the immigration issues absolutely you know so, so you, you so someone who looks at things right wing and they say well you know NAFTA may have been broken a few eggs, but you know we're making an omelet here, and a lot of people have have uh, done and benefited from that. What would you say to something like that? That that uh, a few people might have lost, but in the long run, it was better. Well, what I, think I said at the beginning of the program is a few people got rich. <laughs> That's exactly but I don't how know. I, I, I would I'm put not it. as knowledgeable about these issues as you are. So. That's absolutely it. Uh, these trade deals are essentially written by corporations. Um, and uh, you know they they have corporations in mind and and they're the ones that benefit the most um so one other thing that was established through nafta was something called investment or um investor rights chapters and what it what it essentially does is put language in these trade agreements that uh allow corporations to challenge our uh, local judicial systems. So um, if a cor corporation, a foreign corporation, um, is investing in Oregon and um, they uh, see our environmental protections uh, as an impediment to um, keeping them from profiting, even if they haven't already invested, uh, those predicted profits are uh, something that they can challenge our laws and uh, basically what happens is it goes to uh, an international tribunal and um, if the uh, corporation is, if the case uh, 
is in favor of the corporation, our government uh, will be fine. So that's our tax dollars. So that, our, in this case, would it be Oregon or would it be the, the federal government? If it was uh, a state law, then it would be Oregon or, you know, Oregon tax dollars. And if it's a federal law, of course. Right. Well, I think California's run afoul of that situation because of uh, some kind of gasoline additive. You familiar with that, MTHB or something like that? They were wanting to add it, but it, it was getting into the groundwater, so they stopped it. And there's been there's been a lot of others as well, and and uh, it just seems pretty pretty uh, uh, ironic that a corporation can sue a government, and there's nothing really that we can do about it. And you said the tribunal isn't that tribunal a WTO? Yeah. The, so there's. I'm glad you mentioned that. So the. Um, the difference between WTO tribunals and um, free trade agreement tribunals is that the WTO uh, cases are um, country to country. So many oh, countries okay. want to be, dem you know, they want to be diplomatic. They're not going to do that unless they absolutely have to. Um, however, what these free trade agreements allow is for an individual corporation to sue a government, whether it's a local government, the city of Portland for, say, um, our sweat-free purchasing policy, or um, you know, the state of Oregon for uh, any laws we have to protect our forest, um, or the federal government um, for uh, minimum wage laws, maybe. I'm kind of coming up with that. One. There's a lot of, lot of reasons why they could do that, and this has happened many times in the past as well not just the gasoline thing that I remember. That was the only one I could think of at the moment, but there's been a lot of others as well. And UPS, I think, was involved in one. That's right, and it's not just here in this country. Um, I think one really um, startling case is with the government of El Salvador. Um, there was a Canadian company called Pacific Rim who um, felt that, they're a mining company, they felt that uh, the governments uh, of El Salvador's law against polluting the water uh, was something that impeded on their profits and um, the government actually said no you can't come in and, and mine here because we need to protect this river which is was essentially the source of uh, drinking water for much mm -hmm. of the population. Um, so unfortunately very recently the WTO um, decided to move this case forward um, instead of uh, you know, rejecting it. So you know, it, what this could mean is that uh, the, gov the people of El Salvador will have to pay huge fines um, for having this law. And if they don't want to get sued again, they have to, um, they have to uh, take back their laws um, mm. to protect the environment. So it really, what's at the heart of this is that it undermines democracy and it takes power away from people in the community and puts it in the hands of multinational corporations. So we are talking probably about NAFTA in that instance, right? That was CAFTA, actually. CAFTA, which is, you know, the Central American Free Trade Agreement, the same thing. And uh, so these, like uh, San Salvador, as you mentioned, um, El Salvador, they were a partner to this CAFTA in order for this to happen. So couldn't the country just say, no, we're not, we're through with CAFTA, we don't want anything to do with it anymore. Can they walk away from it? Well, that's really the thing, is that once you have entered into a free trade agreement, then... It's like a treaty. It's like a treaty, and, and it's fairly binding. Um, what's uh, another point that, is, um, that erodes democracy is that uh, a lot of these trade deals, um, or some of them at least, especially the most recent, are all negotiated in secret. So um, the media is locked out. Uh, farmers uh, are locked out, um, you know, indigenous people. Uh, the people who are most affected are barred from looking at these trade deals. However, um, corporate lobbyists uh, have official um, uh, trade advisory status, and that means they not only uh, get to read the text, they also have access to negotiators. Um, so that brings me to uh, the next big free trade agreement that's currently being negotiated uh, called the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Um, 
it says partnership, but it's the same free trade agreements that we've seen. It's a change of the name. Um, this is a trade, massive trade deal, and it's being negotiated uh, with nine different countries um, in the Pacific Rim. And um, you know, uh, like I was mentioning, this is one of the most secretive trade deals uh, to date. Everything's being negotiated by behind closed doors. Um, it's not just the media and the general public that lock, are locked out. Most of our congressional representatives are also barred from seeing the text. Yeah, that, that's terrible. Now you say that the media is locked out, but they can talk about it. The fact that this is going on, I've never seen anything of this in CNN and uh, and uh, MSNBC or any any local news. Do you know of any any of them that are covering it? Or are they are actually a part of this cover-up? Well, you know, um, I, I do think that the media uh, has done some coverage. Um, well, good to hear. <laughs> yeah, and, but I, I think we certainly need to see a whole lot more. Um, I think there, that we did see some media around uh, our own Senator Wyden uh, was pushing for transparency in the Trans-Pacific Partnership negotiations. Mm -hmm. um, he, his role is really significant because uh, he chairs the Senate um, subcommittee on trade. So uh, him pushing for transparency is really, um, really an important thing. And to imagine that you know the chair of the U.S. Senate subcommittee is also barred from being able to see uh, the negotiating texts on the next trade deal is really astounding um, mm -hmm. and really shows you just how hard they're trying to keep this quiet. And how much power they have. Absolutely. Well, you know, since he's, he's uh, the head of the committee, it seems to me I've read about a lot of bills that never made it out of committee. Could the committee squash it and not get it out of committee? Or is this a little bit different? Well, it doesn't go to uh, it doesn't go to committee. Um, you know, all of these trade deals are being negotiated between um, representatives from each country, uh, trade negotiators, and um, you know they're really being pushed hard uh, to complete this round of negotiations. They're actually on their thirteenth round of meetings. Um, this next one will be, in the 13th round will be in San Diego um, from July 2nd to uh, July 10th. And <clears throat> I, I think that this is one where U.S. negotiators are really going to be pushing to, to end it. Um, you know, as I was saying, this is all done in secret. Um, however, there's been a few chapters in the Trans-Pacific Partnership that has been leaked. And um, the first is uh, something, or one is something we've been talking about around investor to state. Um, so the Trans-Pacific Partnership is going to continue to push for um, rights for investors so that they can uh, they can undermine um, the laws that we pass uh, to protect zoning, um, our laws on uh, purchasing preferences, um, our laws on uh, protecting the environment. Um, so, you know, that's what's at risk with that. The other chapter is on, um, is looking at intellectual property rights specifically on extending the life of drug patents. So what that means for people in this country is that it's gonna be harder to afford uh, or to be able to access uh, generic medication, affordable medication. Now that's gonna hurt a lot of people in, in this country with you know, the, this dwindling middle class which you know is also caused by mm -hmm. um, free trade agreements, jobs being outsourced. Um, but for people in poor people in uh, developing countries that are a party to this trade deal, like Malaysia, Vietnam, um, people who are facing life-threatening diseases, this is essentially a death sentence. Um, and I'm not sure if we have the opportunity, but I would love to show uh, this video. That's next up. That's so, next you up. You just led right into it. So I think <laughs> we've got another three-minute clip of what was this young lady's name? Uh, Sonia Smith. 
Sonia just Reed Smith, I think it was. Reed Smith, thank right. you. Right, and it was like a three minute clip, and you might just set this up. It was in Dallas? It was in Addison, Texas, right outside of Dallas, and um, Sonia is from Third World Network. Mm -hmm. And is that, this, this, this was like the 12th meeting? This was the twelfth meeting the outside of the negotiate, yeah, outside of the ne negotiations, and um, she was speaking at an anti uh, TPP rally. All right, well, we'll go into this right now and check it out. And why are they worried? They're worried because Big Pharma has written the rules. Big Pharma is one of the 600 cleared advisors of the US Trade Representative who get to see the text, they get to write the text, and we know what they've written in this case because it leaked. The rest of it is secret. But what has leaked is they have asked for extra monopolies for medicines. So you pay $15,000 per patient per year for your medicines for five more years than you currently have to do. And they want that for all TPP countries, even in Vietnam, where 50% of the population lives on less than $2 a day. How are they gonna pay for medicine prices like that? Because we know when there is no patent monopoly on medicines, the price falls to $67 per patient per year. So what do you want? Do you want $67 or do you want $15,000 for your medicines? <laughs> 67 is what is being negotiated away today in the hotel down the road here. They want the monopolies to go for longer, they want monopolies on the pa more pa medicines to be with a monopoly, and even when there's no patent, they want another monopoly for another five years because they haven't made enough money so far. But it's not just for medicines. They want your textbooks to be expensive, not just for 50 years, but for 120 years before you can photocopy your textbooks. And that's not enough. They want to have the right to pollute the environment. Today, in Peru, there is a smelter which is set up by a foreign company and they are so polluting the environment there that 99% of the kids have lead poisoning. And that, they are suing the Peruvian government for making them clean up under the Peru USFTA. And this is what the USTR wants to expand to all the other TPP countries, to Malaysia, to Vietnam, to Australia, to New Zealand, so that you can no longer regulate mining companies when they pollute the environment, when they endanger their mine workers, and when they kill the kids with lead poisoning. This is what they are asking for because this is the corporate agenda. This is a 1% versus 99%, and it's being negotiated in the interests of the 1%. So we wanted to thank you for coming out here in solidarity. It makes such a difference to the people in the other TPP countries to know there are Americans standing with them, shoulder to shoulder, against this corporate agenda of the 1%. So please keep up your solidarity. It really makes a difference because the demonstrations are occurring from Malaysia to Peru to Australia to New Zealand and today here in Addison. Thank you all. Okay, we're back. Uh, she made a lot of good points. You know, she went into some detail about some of the things you talked about with the the lead poisoning, and uh, it, it really strikes a bell that uh, that these folks, whoever these folks might be, you know, I take it it's mostly in the developed nations that are wanting these high profits. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the Trans-Pacific Partnership is being pushed by international corporations for primarily two basic reasons. One is that they want to be able to access uh, labor markets in countries where uh, people are the most exploited and where uh, environmental regulations are most laxed. Um, and two, they're looking for ways to be able to um, undermine laws that they, like I mentioned before, see mm -hmm. as an impediment to um, their mm -hmm. profits. So what countries would this, would this be that, that they have the, the uh, lower labor and environmental? So they're looking at um, Vietnam as an option. That and popped into my mind. First yeah. Off. yeah. 
And it's an alternative, uh, many corporations see this as an, an alternative uh, to uh, labor costs in China. They feel like Chinese sweatshop workers are getting paid too much and are too uppity. Um, so they're looking at Vietnam where workers are paid one third of what a sweatshop worker in China would make. Um, unions are uh, outlawed and, um, you know, we're going to you know we're going to see a lot of jobs from china being outsourced to vietnam this is really mm -hmm. what we call a, a race to the bottom for workers around the world right yeah, things are so so uh, good in china that they're jumping out of windows of, of sweatshops yeah that's yeah. absolutely so right they, what, they're going to make it even worse in, in vietnam well i know that they've been built, making shoes over in tennis shoes in vietnam for some time it was a while things a while back with with nike about that that died down so maybe I thought maybe they'd moved on to somewhere else, but it's it's coming back around. And you said there was nine countries in the Pacific Rim. You probably can't name them all off, but what one of them was what Australia I think was was one of them. Yeah. Um, so it's Australia, New Zealand, uh, Vietnam, as I mentioned, Singapore, Malaysia, Brunei, um, Peru, Chile, and um, you know. Uh, Brunei, I mentioned, I think I'm, but I, I, the I, U.S. <laughs> the, <laughs> that would be right. one to mention. And the um, Br Brunei, what is that, South America? I've never, never heard uh, of it. Brunei is in South America, yes. Um, you know, one thing that I, I did not mention is it's actually grown already. Um, so uh, Mexico and Canada were just invited to join this week. So just within those countries, this already makes it, uh, is in terms of size and scope, bigger than NAFTA. Um, however, this particular trade deal is being negotiated as a docking agreement, which means that uh, countries can join on over time. Um, so, you know, this is really a mammoth trade deal like we've never seen before. Um, and the impact of it would be uh, devastating for workers around the world. And democracy. And democracy. <laughs> um, but one thing that's kind of interesting about that is that I think we do have some opportunity here. Um, there are so many countries involved and there's so many people, um, you know, in, in these different countries, civil society is really starting to, to uh, mobilize and um, to speak out against it. Um, and we, I think, uh, are really obligated in this country to make sure that we are speaking out against it. And um, I think that what we saw in the last round of negotiations in Dallas, Texas, really gave uh, you know, a lot of hope to what we can be doing. It was amazing coalition building. Um, we uh, linked up with um, Occupy Texas, Occupy Dallas. Uh, they turned out many people. They had several uh, actions and stunts throughout the entire week. Um, and uh, the next clip uh, was uh, with Arthur Stamolis, the director of Citizen Trade Campaign, speaking to a rally outside of the Hotel uh, Intercontinental where uh, the negotiators were um, negotiating behind closed doors. Um, so, so when you say negotiators, that means there was representatives there from all the countries? All the different countries, and yes. And there were probably multiple each one of them, some more than others, had many, many representatives. I'd imagine the United States probably had more than any of them. The U.S. does have several um, representatives. Um, you know, it, it's actually not just the negotiators in there. I mentioned the official advisors. There's 600 um, corporate lobbyists who are acting as official advisors in these negotiations. So that means that they not only um, get to access to the negotiating text, but they also get the ear of the negotiators. So, you know, it's not really hard to imagine. Um, they're standing over the shoulder of negotiators, looking at the documents saying, you know, that doesn't work for us. Strike that. Why don't you try this? Well, who are the negotiators? Are they, are they a part of, our, of the government? Uh, from each country? Negotiators are generally um, 
trade lobbyists or uh, people trying to build their careers as trade lobbyists. Um, well, in other words, they're there for they're for uh, the one percent, not the ninety nine percent. Basically, to put to put it more simplistically, I yeah, I, I, I don't. They're in there to make it work for how, whoever makes the profits from these things. I, th I think it would be a very rare day you'd see a negotiator at an Occupy meeting. That's... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well put. Well, let's go to this Occupy meeting. It wasn't Occupy, but it, Occupy was part of it. And you'll see why in a minute with Arthur. He'll be speaking. I'm sorry to tell you that inside this building, there are people who believe that Chinese witch sweatshop workers are overpaid. back already <laughs> and then um, well that that uh, that was Arthur he's actually was local here and then he uh, I don't know if he lives here anymore but he took over the the National Citizens Trade Organization and uh, he's been on public access a number of times he, you know he's like yourself he's really this is his focus on this program we, we cover a lot of issues and so many of these issues are connected up and where they are connected up a lot of times is uh, is, the, is, the, is the trade policies because of, you mentioned the recession a while back and how people are hurting and, and even though they don't talk about it that way the reason why they are hurting a lot of times is because of the common denominator of, of trade agreements. Mm -hmm. I think that's absolutely right and we definitely saw that from the people who turned out to the rally in Addison, Texas. Um, you know we had uh, an amazing coalition, we had CWA, uh, Communication Workers, Workers of America, America. Yeah. we had the Teamsters come out, uh, we had uh, the Texas AFL-CIO president Becky Bowler leading the rally. Um, so it was it was really um, you know a show of strength. Uh, beyond that, uh, there were like I mentioned several actions throughout the week. Um, Occupy did a Good Morning Texas uh, action outside of the filming of Good Morning Texas, where there was a window. They were able to bring some signs <laughs> uh, that said uh, 
stop uh, TPP secrecy. Um, you know, and that was something that got out to the general public mm -hmm. in a way that, you know, like you mentioned, not so much media, but they certainly got, got it that you day. You use what you have. <laughs> That's there. right. Well, and also there was a group called the s Men who we've actually played something or two from uh, uh, of them in the past, and, and they had something to do here too as well. So maybe we'll just go into that fourth and final click with the yes men and then we'll come back and finish off. So there are about 20 of us here in Dallas. We're at the Trans-Pacific Trade Negotiations. Yes, that's very generic because you're not supposed to know about it. I'm gonna be giving an award, uh, Corporate Power Tool Award, uh, delivering a short speech. Uh, I'm very excited about. I've done uh, I've done a lot of theater, nothing quite like this, uh, where I don't, I don't think the audience is really anticipating uh, theater. <laughs> Margaret and Marie. That would be us. Are you twins? Sometimes. <laughs> the purple is the United States people, and then the green. What is the green ones? The press. I would like to personally thank the administrations, trade negotiators, for, hold on. we're okay, cool. But my favorite label for Ron Kirk is, he's a great guy that knows how to get things done. Please help me welcome Ron Kirk, our United States trade ambassador. Now you can't get a former mayor of Dallas, have y'all in my town not let me brag about Texas. We have more retail space in North Texas than anywhere in America. In fact, there is a Latin saying that we use in Dallas called Vine Vidi Visa. We came, we saw, we shopped. Have a great evening and thank you all for the great work you're doing. Hello, thank you so much for being here. My name is Git Haversall, and on behalf of the Texas Corporate Power Partnership, we are very, very pleased to announce that the U.S. trade negotiators are the winners of our 2012 Corporate Power Tool Award. Yeah! We would like to personally thank the negotiators for their relentless efforts. Um, the TPP agreement is shaping up to be a great way for us to maximize our profits um, regardless of what the public of this nation or any other nation thinks is right. Well, thank you all for joining us for the formal part of our reception. Please continue to mingle, have good discussions, and thank you for joining us this evening. Reception will continue. And Mr. Kirk, if you could please uh, accept this award on behalf of negotiators. If you come back into the hotel, you will be arrested for trespassing. Even though I have proper accreditation? It's a private hotel, sir. If they want you out, you are now out. Okay. Okay? That's a nice piano. Thank you. If you would, please. To the... That's the swimming pool. That's the swimming pool. There you go. Thank you, gentlemen. Have Thank you. Night. Appreciate it. Look up TPP and read what it's all about. Oh, the secrecy of it. All right, well, welcome back. Uh, we got about a little over seven minutes. Uh, you said you want, oh, we want to talk about the event, right? All right, yeah, uh, thank you. So um, we are uh, going to be organizing an action um, at looking at three of uh, the big corporations pushing for the Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership. It's uh, Verizon, FedEx and Walmart, and we will be uh, meeting at, um, at Pioneer Square on Monday, July 2nd at 12 noon um, near Starbucks. And uh, we're going to march over to Verizon. We're going to hear uh, Madeline Elder 
uh, president of CWA, CWA yeah. 7901. Yeah. Um, she's going to speak about uh, you know, how Verizon is uh, mistreating workers in this country and talk about uh, you know, not only that, they want to push for this trade deal that uh, is um, you know, a race to the bottom for workers everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, then we'll go over to FedEx and we'll hear uh, from Teamsters about um, you know, FedEx's anti-union campaign um, and uh, you know another big corporation pushing for a trade deal um, that only benefits the one percent. Then we'll go over to Walmart where we have uh, UFCW um, uh, representative Bob Marshall who will talk about uh, the Walmart campaign and uh, mm -hmm. what they're doing there, uh, where, what Walmart's doing here um, that is hurting workers. Right. Um, so uh, I think it'll be an excellent event. It'll be a two hour, um, two hour action. We're gonna be hitting three congressional districts, uh, three corporations, all within Portland. Um, so it should be really exciting. Mm -hmm. um, would love people for people to join us and i think uh, you had the information All right that's been playing a, a number of times that's and it should be mentioned that this isn't going to be the only one i mean this is going on the 13th meeting or whatever as you call it is going on in san diego and there will be actions there but there'll be actions all over the country and maybe in other countries too as well no that's absolutely right um it's a national day of action and you know if, if you uh live outside of Portland or if you're not able to make that date you could just grab a friend and uh, you know go to one of the corporations that um, you know are on the list uh, Cargill um, you know, Verizon AT&T uh, Halliburton you can go to their local headquarters and uh, bring with you a sign that says uh, US trade representative stop the secrecy on the TPP um, or however right. <laughs> creatively is, is you'd that like list to put on it. your on the website that's right yeah if you go to our website you can uh, find all the information there and uh, if you shoot in the photos shoot in your best photos um, we're going to compile that into a poster that will be delivered to uh, the US trade representative Ron Kirk at the negotiations in San Diego um, you know, and it's not just Ron Kirk who we want to get, in, get the attention of. When um, the negotiators from other countries see that, you know, it's not just everyone in the U.S. is behind this, uh, it gives them a little more, um, gives them a little bit more support so that they can oppose mm -hmm. things like intellectual property rights that will um, extend the life of drug patents, um, which is obviously not in the interests of the public. Because we, we've talked about the media coverage or uncoverage of this. I know with the Korea Free Trade Agreement was going on in Korea, South Korea, there was, I think there was a rally with a million people hit the streets. A large number, it was in the hundreds of thousands anyway, and uh, you know we didn't hear about that over here at all. And uh, you know, you mentioned those three that you're going to be stopping at. I think all three of them are members of the the uh, Alec, yeah, the I American think you're right. Legislative Exchange Group, whatever that is, commission or whatever. Now, uh, that is a group that has that we had some folks on a while back that was talking about how they're trying to privatize a post office, and and that is just. You know, they, they are working on that front to privatize the post office and other privatization of other agencies. Uh, and now they're also working on this front, too, because there's a lot of back and forth between, I would think, these these trade agreement negotiators and, and ALEC. Mm -hmm. I, would, I would suspect that, but I don't know that for a fact. Yeah, no, I think that's absolutely right. And uh, I think you bring up another important point that uh, a lot of these corporations are pushing for this trade deal so that they can uh, further privatization and deregulation of banks so that we can't uh, create protections against, say, no. too big to fail. Um, so the 2008 um, economic crisis is something that we've learned nothing from if we allow uh, free trade agreements like the Trans-Pacific Partnership to go through and, uh, and essentially block government from being able to regulate responsibly. Mm -hmm. 
you know, the, the view, to the viewers that we, what we've been talking about here. I mean, you know, we, we, it looks like a lot of this is the, the progressive left is, uh, is uh, opposing this. But you stop and think about it. Sovereignty and uh, these things being done in the dark, that should be a concern of the right as well. And hopefully, you know, we can get both sides to get together on this one because, uh, you know, those people out there that love their guns and all that, well, you know, they don't want America to lose its sovereignty. And it has in a number of, in a number of cases that have been brought forward to the WTO and, and these different trade, uh, what, what do you call it, trade courts or whatever. And so uh, we're down to a little over a minute. You want to finish this thing up here? Yeah. There's a lot of directions you can take. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, you know, I think in many ways opposing trade deals has become very bipartisan as more and more people uh, have their jobs good outsourced. To hear. Good to hear. Um, yeah. you know, it, and really, what is going to defeat this trade deal is the same as what we saw with the battle in Seattle. It's people becoming educated on the issue and speaking out. Um, and this is something that we can shut down if we have enough people uh, reaching out to their congressional leaders and saying, no more NAFTAs, no NAFTA of the Pacific. We need trade deals that are put in place to protect the public interest. Yeah, and have the light shining on it. You know, that's the biggest thing. If, if they won't shine the light on it, you know they're doing something in the dark there that, uh, that we wouldn't approve of. That's absolutely right. All right. Well, that's it. We're down to 15 seconds. I want to thank the crew for uh, making this possible. I want to thank Elizabeth especially for coming in here and, and uh, bringing this information forward. And we'll, we'll keep you posted on what's going on. Thanks for tuning in.